Many of you know him from your classes on research or his research that he's done around the school. So you know that he eats, sleeps, and lucid dreams about technology. At any time, day or night, you'll find a line of people to his office either waiting to ask what new device to buy or to ask how they can spy on their boyfriend or girlfriend who's cheating on them. <laughs> for, those, for those who have visited, visited his office, you will quickly notice that Professor Want sets up his office like it's his own wing in the college with his cameras at the door and his computers and interesting devices all over the office. There's a few of them that you will never find out what they do, so don't even try. Um, the closest thing that I've ever seen to Gotham, wait, I think New York City, I'm sorry, um, will ever have to a real Batcave. As a matter of fact, if one day, possibly, I were to become Batman, <laughs> Want would be uh, the head of my RD division. He will be my Morgan Freeman. <laughs> so, it, so it's only right that Professor Want is the one that is giving this presentation that you're hearing this evening. And I promise you, you will learn a lot. So please, join me in giving a warm welcome to Professor Adam Scott Want. I have to start off by thanking uh, the John Jay College of Criminal Justice Center for Cybercrime Studies. Those of you who have never been to a cybercrime lecture at the college, we have them here several times a semester, usually upstairs. Uh, we bring in fascinating speakers from around the country to talk about issues of cybercrime. I'm a researcher with the Cybercrime Center. When I first came to John Jay and I had some ideas about the areas I wanted to start to research um, with information security, the Cybercrime Center was there not only to support me, but also to help me find funding and help me get the equipment that I need to get started. Um, so I just wanted to give a, a shout out, for lack of a better word, to the Center for Cybercrime Studies at John Jay. Today, everything is digital, or almost everything is digital. Information is ubiquitous. It is everywhere. It is in our hands, and it's in our computers, it's in the air, it travels at the speed of light all around us. Much of what we do today in our daily lives it is channeled and funneled through digital means. And we, we don't stop to think often enough about what that means. If we look at smartphone adoption rates in the United States, for example, these are the smartphone adoption rates from 2009 into the projected 2014. And what's really interesting about these rates, first of all, when I did, invest, when I did my research, the first thing I found out is that there are no real firm numbers. There are several uh, numbers that are universally agreed upon, but it's really hard to tell smartphone adoption rates in the United States. The experts disagree by as much as 8% at any given moment. But the one thing that's obvious is that if you go back to 2009 and before, which is not too long ago, smartphone rates in the United States, adoption rates were well under 20%. But in 2012, last year, for the first time, smartphone adoption rates in the United States surpassed 50%. So today, more than half of Americans are carrying around a smartphone. By 2014, we expect that number to be up around 80%. So what does it mean that eight out of every 10 people walking around on the streets have a smartphone, or will have a smartphone out of next year? If we look at John Jay as an example, in New York, we're always special. New York's a special place. And if we look at your numbers, John Jay student numbers, the numbers are even higher. In 2009 and 2010, it was just below 25%, below 50% in 2010. We think between 2010 and 2011, we surpassed that 50% mark. So we surpassed it two years before the national average. Today, according to CUNY Institutional Research and the 2012 Student Experience Survey, we think at John Jay, the smartphone adoption rate is somewhere between the mid-80s and the low-90s, but it's really hard to tell. The numbers differ from survey to survey. It might be in the, in the, it, it, somewhere in the 80s. Let's just say it's in the 80s. By 2014, we expect it to be near 100%. In my personal classes, uh, last semester, every single one of my students uh, other than one had a smartphone. And this semester, every single one of my students other than two have smartphones. So what does that really mean? What information, and what I'm looking at, what information is going over these smartphones? And how do, they propose, how do they propose security risks to the people who are carrying them? If we look at market share distribution of smartphones in the United States, 
as of the fourth quarter of last year. So we're only talking about a month or two ago. Android has almost 50%. They're dominating the market at 48.5%. There are lots of phones out there with Android. iPhone is at about 32%. Blackberry RIM, about 11 to 12%. That 1.7%, that's Windows Phone. And then everything else is about 6.2%. What's important to recognize here is that an overwhelming number of smartphone operators are using Android and iOS. So if an, if an attacker or if law enforcement were to focus their efforts on one of the, or two of these systems, it makes sense from a system standpoint to choose systems that are used by the majority of people. And if you can go between Android and or iOS, you have almost all of it covered. If we break it down as to race, as to 2011, what we find is actually quite interesting. The lowest percentage group in the United States that have smartphones are white Caucasians at 44.7% and the highest being Asian Pacific Islanders. Why I'm, I'm finding this information interesting is because what we used to have this thing called the digital divide. We still have the digital divide in this country where the have nots have trouble affording technology. But what we're seeing, if you look at it either by race or socioeconomic status, we're seeing the digital divide virtually disappear due to mobile technology. And that's something that's really important. At the same time, it's become a cultural icon. Uh, the iPhone, or even an Android phone, the, the people on the subways or the trains, we know that this is what happens. We see it every day. People are using smartphones everywhere. They bring it with them everywhere they go. One of the things I looked at in my research is the savviness of the smartphone user because the savviest of the smartphone user will help you understand the risk the smartphone user has for exposure. For example, the basic smartphone user, maybe they're only using phones, contacts, emails, and games. Most of them might not even be able, most of them might not even be using emails and games, right? A lot of people, basic smartphone users, are just using the phone and contacts. So what risk do these people have? The average smartphone user they use the basic functions, but they're also heavy application users. They use large amounts of bandwidth. They use large amounts of video. They look at YouTube all the time. Many of these people are astute enough to have second telephone lines on their phone. Anybody here have Line 2 or heard of Line 2? And they spend the most money on their phones as well. Finally, you have the adept smartphone user or the expert. Um, I consider myself an expert smartphone user. At this point, the expert smartphone user, they no longer care about the phone or the device itself. For me, it doesn't matter if it's a phone or a tablet or a laptop. What's, for me, what's on one device is on all my devices. Everything is the same. Any file I have anywhere in the world, I could access from my smartphone, as long as I have it set up that way. And what kind of risk do I have? If my smartphone is compromised, I could take all the security um, considerations in the world with my home system or my work system. I could have files encrypted. I could have them backed up. I could have them in st uh, stored correctly. I could have all the safeguards and precautions. But if I can't bring those safeguards to my smartphone, what's the risk? I should mention, this line of research and, and this work, it's actually chunks of several different things that I'm looking at. And I'm actually using this lecture to prepare for another lecture that I'm going to give in October for the Association of Inspectors General. And in giving that presentation, we're really going to focus on investigations. But in this lecture, I'm going to jump around a little bit because I want your, your opinion. We're going to have some questions and answers. Um, I'm going to jump around a little bit. And we're going to look at law for a second. Then we're going to go back to technology. The law is critical when it comes to this stuff. The law is what we have to protect us, to keep us safe, to punish criminals to regulate our conduct. The problem is that is when it comes to the law, the law and the policies behind them haven't kept up with the times. They're so far behind, the law does not protect us. Back in the days of the telephone, a law was passed, which we'll get to in a moment. And what the law said was that your geographical location information can't be transmitted over a telephone. If you call me from your home line, 
I could see your caller ID, but it can't transmit your exact address and location. And those were the rules that applied to the phone systems. The Electronic Communications Privacy Act is one of the really important pieces of legislation that control this stuff. It was passed in 1986, and it hasn't been su substantially updated since. We're about to, and we'll look at that. So the mo one of the most important pieces of legislation affecting both investigations and privacy comes from a time when before I even went to high school. Think of what technology was like in 1986. Let me give you a really good example of how the law hasn't kept up with the times. The Electronic Communications Privacy Act, when it comes to criminal investigations, it places a presumption. And the presumption is that if you leave your email on your servers for more than six months, they're presumed to be abandoned. And once they're presumed to be abandoned, the government no longer needs a warrant to access them. They only need to meet the standard of showing that it's part of a criminal investigation. Who here in the audience has emails on Gmail or Hotmail that are older than six months? You have abandoned your emails. I mean, how many people consider those emails truly abandoned? The federal government does. If you're a law enforcement official, that's a good thing. Because if you're a law enforcement official, it allows you to do investigations into people without them knowing about it. You never have to go to court. And unless you arrest them, you never have to tell them you were looking at them. So from an investigation standpoint, what a great thing. I can investigate you, and I can have every email as soon as it turns six, month, six months old, and I don't even have to go to court for a warrant. But from a privacy standpoint, that's pretty scary. It's those types of complications that we have right now and that Congress really needs to address. And it's not just the Electronic Communications Privacy Act that's complicating all of this. There are many other acts. The Stored Communications Act, for example, which allows government to reach out to your cloud service providers. The USA Patriot Act, the Protect America Act, and for any of you who know how they work, national security letters. These are all legal mechanisms that are put into place to help with legitimate investigations. Um, I'll tell you about it in a second, but we're going to be looking at a lot of this from two sides, legitimate investigations and privacy. I also want to talk really quick about a really old piece of law called the third party doctrine. The third party doctrine really complicates this issue. It's old law, common law from long ago. What the third party doctrine basically says, if I dumb it down, is that if you have a secret and you tell somebody that secret, it's no longer a secret. And since it's no longer a secret, the government has the right to access it for criminal investigations and for other proceedings where they normally wouldn't have had the right to access it before. So let me give you some real life examples of how this used to play out in the old days before, techno before modern technology. If John and Lisa were getting a divorce and John goes to his attorney to talk to his attorney about the case, so John and his attorney are locked in a room away from the public having a private conversation. We mostly, most of us understand that that's covered by attorney-client privilege, correct? But now if John tells anybody about that conversation, if he goes home and tells his sister about the conversation, or if John was stupid enough to bring his sister to the meeting in the first place when she wasn't needed, just the presence of the sister or the sister knowing about it afterwards, could the third party could break down that privilege to the point where it actually could no longer exist. So even that attorney could be forced to testify about parts of the conversation. If you have a secret, you have to keep it to yourself. There are some, ex some exemptions, spouses, attorney clients, some psychiatrist privileges. But for the most part, under the third party doctrine, if you tell somebody your secret, it's no longer a secret. I have an iPad mini I carry around. It contains my secrets. I don't have any major secrets, really. 
where I'm going, what I'm eating, where I'm doing my private communications. If I'm backing my iPad up to a third-party cloud storage solution, such as iCloud, I am taking all of my information and I'm giving it to iCloud, that third party. The law today is starting to suggest that my, by me backing up my iPad to the cloud, I am giving it to a third party and therefore releasing all of my, all of my expectations of privacy. Now, I don't know about you, but just because I back up my iPad to the cloud, I still have an expectation of privacy. But the government doesn't recognize that right now. So your emails that go through mail servers, your private Facebook messages, your journals and diaries that are kept online, even if meant to be private, there is a legitimate argument that they fall under the third party doctrine and therefore are no longer private. You no longer have that expectation of privacy. So it's one of the many pieces of legislation, or it's not a piece of legislation, it's one of the many legal principles we really need to take a close look at because I don't want to give up all my privacy just by protecting myself with common sense backups. Now, Congress is trying to do something about this. The Geolocation Privacy and Surveillance Act is, a, is an act currently before Congress. It's an act that wants to establish privacy guidelines for people against the government and private corporations, which is far more important these days. Who knows what's going to happen with this? And we're not going to talk about it more today. But it's a really important piece of legislation that should, people need to take a close look at because we need to fix what is going on right now. We need to fix it for our law enforcement officials that work really hard. And we need to fix it for our people that deserve some sort of privacy. Let's talk a little bit about technology. The days of the Zach Morris cell phone are over. You know, everyone knows Zach Morris from Saved by the Bell, and if you don't, I feel very old, which I shouldn't. <laughs> he, uh, he had one of the early cell phones in the show, and he would carry it around, and these cell phones were a real beast. They sucked up a lot of power. Uh, the reason you can't use a cell phone in a hospital, most people don't know the background, but the reason you can't use a cell phone in a hospital still today was because of this phone. These phones were so powerful back then, their transmissions would mess up hospital frequencies. Not today. Today we have something new. Today we have things that are, it's much more than a phone. This isn't a phone. I don't know why we're still calling it a phone. How many people make phone calls on their smartphone? A lot, a little? I mean, are you really using it as a phone anymore? It's a converged digital media device. Brings everything together. And it does it with a bunch of sensors that are scary as hell. It has assisted GPS to know where you are, a digital compass to know which direction you're facing. It has Wi-Fi to communicate over 802.11. It has cellular antennas which could communicate over one of five or six different standards. It has a three-access gyroscope to know which direction it's turned and an accelerometer to know if it's moving a proximity sensor to know what's around it, an ambient light sensor to know what the ambient light in the room is, knows if you're sleeping, if knows if you're awake, has a high definition video camera and high definition audio. This is not a phone, it's a surveillance device that you're nice enough to carry around with you. And from the surveillance device, we can calculate your location almost anywhere within 50 feet. If you're out of Manhattan, we can even get better location. In Manhattan, it's a little hard. We get angular velocity. I can turn those sensors on on your phone and not only tell which way your phone's moving, but what angle and how fast. We can look at pitch, raw, and yaw. We can look at rotation around gravity. Centrifugal force can be measured by your iPad or iPhone or your Android. And we have six access motion sensing. Second by second analysis of everything this device is doing. Which way it's turned, which way it's moving, what's around it, it's all capable. Some people are already starting to make a profit on this. Exercise applications, for example. 
Some require an external sensor. This one doesn't. Simply put the phone in your pocket and run. Activates its pedometer. It uses its gyroscope. It uses its accelerometer. It uses its GPS. It uses its Wi-Fi. And it tells you how far you're running down the block and what you're exercising and how many calories you're burning. It's using those sensors for good. Help you lose weight. Help you get into shape. Another application called sleep time. Sleep time uses the gyroscope, accelerometer, ambient light sensor, proximity sensor, and microphone. You put, your thing on, you put the phone under your pillow before you go to sleep, and it records your sleep patterns and movements. It knows when you're moving in your sleep, so it knows how deep you're asleep. It knows when you wake up, it knows when you go to sleep, it knows when you start snoring, stop moving, it looks at all of these, and it measures your sleep, and it helps wake you up at the right time when you're in the right rhythms. I have used this, pretty accurate, it's interesting. But they're using all of these sensors to obtain information on you. Matter of fact, today the world, all of the information in the world is in the palm of your hand. And we're all connected, all of us, at all times. So my question, and many privacy advocates' question, are could you take all of these sensors and devices and do harm with them? Could I use these sensors and devices that you're carrying around without your knowledge? Could I use them without your knowledge? Could we either take control of these sensors or devices? Could we obtain intelligence and information from them? Could we use them for law enforcement purposes? Those are questions we're going to look at now. Um, everything I go over, there'll be two sides to it, and I'm not taking a side here. On one side, we have cyber investigations enabling us to stop crime and terrorism. And on the other side of this very closely balanced scale, we have privacy. Now, when I start one of my classes, two of my classes at John Jay, the first thing I say is, welcome, I'm Adam Want, and you no longer have any privacy. You no longer have any legitimate privacy. And that's not really a good thing, necessarily. But everything that we go over from here on, and I'm going to give you four big cases to discuss. We're going to talk about four major incidents. We could look at the privacy, we could look at the cyber investigations, and we can balance the two. And I think the purpose of government is to balance those two. To find a good balance between giving the law enforcement officials the powers that they need to investigate crime, while giving us at least privacy to keep our personal life personal if we want to do that. Now unfortunately most of you broadcast your life off of, over Facebook 24-7. Coming up here I got two or three questions. Could I record this? Could I put it on Twitter? So even like pictures right now are being taken and put online. We're recording this to put online for the college. On the investigation side of it, here are some names you should know. On the left-hand column, we have federal agencies or police, like the United States Secret Service, the Federal Bureau of Investigation, the United States Military, and large police agencies. Those four groups, uh, I should have put banks in here too, I uh, actually, but I didn't. Those groups, along with banks and the financial industry, do almost the huge majority of the cyber investigations in this country. On the right, we have companies that prepare devices for their use and prepare software and mobile forensics. Celebrite, we'll look at in a moment. Many of you have heard of it. Guidance Software, which makes Encase. Kroll, a consulting company and firm that's very close to John Jay College. They put out software for this as well. Access Data, which makes Forensic Toolkit. KPMG, the, 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 the consulting company. Price Waterhouse. All of these groups are on the investigation side, working every single day to stop child exploitation, to stop child pornography, to stop terrorists from laundering money. These people dedicate their lives to protecting us. So it's really important that they have the legal tools necessary that are constitutionally valid to protect us. On the other side, we have certain privacy groups, and here are three of them that are worth talking about. The American Civil Liberties Union, really big one, really important. The Electronic Frontier Foundation, the EFF. 
and academics, frankly, they provide a lot of your privacy control. They call out the government when they overstep their bounds. They provide amicus briefs to courts. They're all really interested in policy. So I told you we're going to talk about four situations, and this is the heart of the lecture. These are situations that I'm looking at very closely. Each one of these is designed to provoke a response from you. All of you will probably fall into one of these categories. All of you should understand how this really works in a moment. The first situation that I want to discuss is physical access to your smartphones. There are many ways to investigate or to compromise the privacy of your smartphone. Nothing's better than getting physical access to it. A smartphone in the right person's hands is an unlimited amount of information. Think of the data you put over your smartphone. Think of the information. I don't care if you delete it, it's still there. The text messages, the phone calls, the pictures, the emails, the apps. Getting physical access to your phone is very close to getting physical access to your mind for some of us. How many people think they fall into that category? I'm just curious, by a show of hands, how many people would say that getting physical access to their phone is like getting physical access to their mind? Just curious, raise your hands. I do consider that for me. I consider my phone an and my computer an extension of my mind. It's not a device for me. It's part of me, as ridiculous as that sounds. I should have wrote what state this was. Whoops. Think Michigan. Michigan or Minnesota? This is Michigan or Minnesota State Police. Michigan? Somebody know for sure? Good. Michigan State Police. Michigan State Police had a program that some of you might find interesting. They used a Cellbrite UFED device. This is a Cellbrite UFED Touch Ultimate. This is the best of the best of mobile digital device forensics. Would love to get one of these from John Jay. And when Cellbrite watches this, maybe they can get us one. John Jay would love a Cellbrite unit to teach our students with. They're extremely expensive. These could download your entire iPhone in under two minutes, even if it's full. And what the state police, we said Michigan? What Michigan State Police were doing is driving around with their highway patrol, pulling people over, and getting them to voluntarily submit to a cell phone interrogation. So they would pull you over, you've been speeding, you want a ticket or, or you want to participate in a program we're trying to catch drug dealers trafficking drugs. I don't want to write you a ticket. Would you participate in a program and let me analyze your phone that will help the police build a data set that will help us solve crimes in the future? It sounds pretty legitimate, right? You don't realize that the phone is being plugged into this unit, which in the matter of two minutes, this is, this is the software, downloads and recovers everything. Anything that's been deleted, it doesn't matter. It puts it into really nice categories to look at. Application usage, calendar, call log, notes, SMS text messages, including deleted ones, web history, the wireless networks you've connected to. This is cool because I could prove you have been somewhere off of the records that have been contained in the wireless network profiles. Web history, user accounts, locations, the Cellbrite UFED device in two minutes populates this data set and your phone is handed back to you and you're off on your way. Now, it's, this is a very expensive device. So expensive, it's hard for us even to get one. It's hard for us to justify spending that much money for a couple of training sessions. But you don't need to spend that much money. Linux, there's a free open source operating system of Linux called Backtrack 5. How many people have heard of it? Um, those of you who are in my 750 class, we use it in class. Backtrack 5 comes with an iPhone analyzer that's open source and free. It's not going to do what Celebrite does. It's not going to do what the UFED does. 
This one analyzes backups made on a computer. So when you plug in your iPhone to, to the computer to do a backup, it creates a backup file that this takes apart. Anyone can download this, go home and play with it. Not that hard to figure out how to use. This is really important for us to talk about because just by getting physical access to your device for two minutes, anyone can make a complete image of your device and be able to take it apart years afterwards. So it might not be so important to the person that was pulled over at the time, but when that information goes into a data set that's analyzed days, months, or years later, when their deleted text messages are brought back, when their deleted pictures are recovered, I don't think that people might have, they don't know what they went in for, what they're in for, if that makes any sense. At the same time, police departments all over the country are using the UFED to automatically image and inventory smartphones that are in the possession of people when arrested. So if you're arrested for something totally unrelated, drunken and disorderly conduct, possession of a drug, disorderly conduct, assault, whatever you're arrested for. In many parts of the country, if you're brought into jail, well, in all parts of the country, if you're arrested and brought in, they do an inventory of your property, a legal inventory. Police departments are starting to inventory cell phones as well, where they'll make an image using a UFED device of the cell phone of everybody, and then if they need it later on in the criminal investigation, they have it. And they don't even necessarily need a warrant to do it because the inventory right is something that's recognized under the law. And the law in all areas isn't clear enough yet to tell us whether or not that's right or wrong. Is it the same going through your pockets or your trunk of your car as it is going through your smartphone? Courts are undecided or split in all parts of the country on that. Situation number one the physical access. For an investigator, you want access to the person's device. You want access to their smartphone. You want access to their computers. Even if you don't use the information you get, just to obtain it could tell you so much. But from the privacy standpoint, is that disturbing? Is it disturbing that if you're arrested for throwing a fit in a bar, that your cell phone could be inventoried and copied and put into a database that can come back later on, years later. I'll tell you from an investigator's point of view, it's a great thing. But from a privacy standpoint, it's not. Situation two is far more dangerous. If you think that's dangerous, wait until we go to two. The service providers, AT&T, Verizon, Sprint, Boost, Cricket, T-Mobile, there are a lot out there. Ultimately, it boils down to Verizon, Sprint, and AT&T for the most part. Most of everything goes over their networks. What do they know about you? What do they know about you just by you carrying around their phones? And how does the law protect that information? Or even does it? Here are the types of things cell phone companies keep as records. Pen registry, trap and trace information. Who you call and who they call. Cell site information. Where are you when you place that call? Here's. <laughs> Who else is making calls on the same tower at the same time? Part of the standard reports. So if I want to know who John called from the corners of 59th and 10th at 3 o'clock in the morning, those records are easy, even if I don't know John's phone number. I could find out what phones made calls from that area. And as part of the report, I get all the other calls. Uh, they record call content at times, and we'll talk about how that works at the end. 
They record text messages and MMSs. If you send somebody a text, yes, they know you sent that text, and yes, there's a record of that text, and yes, the actual content of that text is kept as well. Email, URL, ISP, DNS connections. Every website you visit, every connection you make, every app that you launch that makes a connection, it all leaves a recording, it all leaves a mark. And the most dangerous out of all of them, live or historical geolocation information. Where you are and what you have done, or where you've been. And the problem is that it, this information, if a request is done, isn't only necessarily isolated to the suspect. First, second, third degree information comes back at times. So since we're all connected, if you happen to call somebody who's being investigated, and that investigation is large enough, the software could automatically make you part of the investigation. So now you're looked at, and all the people you call are analyzed. From a law enforcement standpoint, this is great. And cops know exactly where to go to get the information when they want it. Verizon, Sprint, AT&T, all of them have guides for law enforcement, manuals, to advise them how to get information when they need it. And these manuals are online, you could find them. This is the cover of the Verizon manual. So the question is, what information are, the, uh, are these cell phone providers keeping? Well, I'm going to go past AT&T and I'm going to go to Sprint, then Verizon, because I know the answers for that. Sprint received over 200,000 requests from law enforcement for geographical location, geolocation data on Sprint subscribers. 200,000 requests. It, they had so many requests that Sprint launched a self-service portal for law enforcement to access. So if you're a law enforcement officer with the proper rights, you can access the Sprint self-service portal. And in that portal, for each Sprint Nextel customer, you can go back several years at least five, and get five years of almost minute by minute information. Five years. Definitely three, probably five at this point. Of minute by minute information on where every Sprint customer has been. Every phone call they've made, every text message. It's in a permanent computer data set. And the best part is, is law enforcement doesn't even need to go to Sprint to get it. There's a self-service portal now. This is great for investigators. If you're an investigator and you're investigating somebody and you have the legal right to obtain their information through a warrant or other process, you can sign right into the Sprint self-service portal and on a very large map that looks just like Google Maps, be able to set the day and time to whatever you want and see exactly where your suspect has been years back. Verizon doesn't keep as long records, but they, their records, I think, go back two to three years at this point, we think. But we know Sprint goes back many years. Um, do you choose your cell phone based on the, the, the amount of time the carrier keeps your information? Do you choose your cell phone based on who has best service? Do you choose your cell phone based on best pricing? Everyone has different priorities here. But for law enforcement, it's critical to know that during your investigations, you just need to go to a computer and you have absolute evidence. Not absolute evidence, that's not the right word. You have very good circumstantial evidence as to where the, the, your suspect was. Most people are where their phones are, and most juries buy that. Does that make sense to everybody? Situation three, spyware. This gets dangerous. There are 
a host of both commercially available and private programs out on the market which are designed simply to spy on your phones. $49 is all you need to get a hold of a good one. E-phone tracker, for example, is being marketed to spouses who suspect their spouses are cheating. You grab your spouse's phone while they're in the shower, and in five minutes, you secretly upload a program to it that they don't know about, where you could listen to their calls as they're talking. You can get their contacts, their email forwarded to you, their text messages, and their GPS. And you can even set the interval that the GPS is sent to you. So if you want to know where they are 10 minutes by 10 minutes, or minute by minute, or hour by hour, e-phone tracker for $49 a year will give that to you. They'll ignore the fact that installing it on somebody else's phone is a crime. They'll say, if you own the phone, you could install it legally. Most spouses, I assume, would assume they own each other's phones. The U.S. Senate, there's a bill in the U.S. Senate to outlaw this, by the way. The government doesn't want people doing this. This does not play out well when it comes to things like domestic violence. This is not recommended people do. This doesn't end well. If you have to spy on your spouse, you shouldn't be with them. It works on Android or iOS. Android's a problem in itself due to its open source operating system. It has become increasingly easy to spy on Android users. I was at DEF CON last year uh, in Vegas. And I walked into a lecture where they were discussing how easy it is to turn on the microphone in somebody's Android phone and listen to them without them knowing. Or the web camera and see them. Matter of fact, certain companies are selling software that does it for you and it takes the magic out of it. Um, environmental listening. Imagine a shady room in your child. I mean, they're trying to sell this to pe parents protecting their kids, but we all know there are many other uses of this. So that if you think your spouse or your coworker or your colleague or your worst enemy is doing something wrong, you can install this software on their phone and listen to them all the time. They would have no clue. Software like this also supports taking pictures with the webcam or video and uploading them so you could see where they are and what they're doing. It's out there on the web. In my information security class later this semester, we're going to be downloading and configuring one of these softwares to see how they work, setting it up. Again, this is not something you should be using on your spouse or your kids necessarily, but it gets even worse. I don't know if anyone's, anyone knows this disaster. Finn Fisher is a UK-based company that creates government spyware. They create the software that governments all around the world are using to spy on their people. Two scandals have broken. One of the scandals is that they're selling their software to governments that are less than reputable. Their software was being used to crack down on human rights advocates, for example, and spy on them. The real problem with Finn Fisher's software is it could, be installed, it could be installed remotely. So you no longer need access to the phone to install the software. You can install it remotely by tricking the user into clicking on a link. They won't even know what's going on. And then to access the user's phone, you simply send a text message with a special code. The text message doesn't even necessarily go through to the user, but it commands the phone to take a picture, to turn on its webcam, to turn on its audio, to forward SMSs. They created this really powerful software for governments to spy on its people. And from the best I could tell, they lost a copy, allegedly. There's a lot of research out there that shows that this software has made its hands into the black market. 
I had been looking for a copy of it and I found what were some bad links of it. But there is a very high chance that a copy of their software got stolen and leaked out and that the code is online and it's being used by hackers all over the world and remotely uploaded to their servers. Matter of fact, we even found a press release from Finn Fisher admitting that this is happening. It's hard, however, to tell if the press release is real. Press release is real. So whenever looking at these things online, you really need to look at them you know, with, with a skeptical eye. You can do your own research on the Finn Fisher issue. Made Bloomberg News. So Bloomberg reported on it. The question of whether they actually lost a piece of software is questionable. So you can go do your own research and take a look. If they did lose a piece of this software, that's very serious. Because it makes it so that anyone without skill, or a massive amount of skill, could remotely upload spyware to anybody's phone without them ever knowing, and spy on them 24-7. We could do it now, but this makes it 10 times easier. Situation four, third-party apps. Our final situation for the evening. Now, this is the part of the research that's not all mine. Um, when, again, when I was at DEF CON last year, I ran into a cybercrime researcher who, who's doing this with the ACLU and we're trying to get him into the college to come and speak. Um, and what's really interesting about his research is he's concentrating on privacy and he's concentrating on privacy issues. I want to concentrate on investigation issues having to do with the information that's collected when you use a third party application. Pandora. Everybody use Pandora? What information are you giving up by using Pandora? You wouldn't think of you giving up information, right? But what information are you giving up and to who? And who has access to that information? The Wall Street Journal found this very interesting. And they actually have a website you can go and visit after class. I'm going to show it to you now because the best way I could show you all of this is to show you the Wall Street Journal. This is a cool website. Um, I will make the website available on my Twitter account uh, at, at prof underscore want for those of you who, who are interested in going to it. This is going to be challenging. So the way this website works is they actually went out and investigated like 100 apps or something like that. And they hired a security researcher. And this is an experiment that anybody in the digital forensics team, any of our digital forensics students here could do this. This is easy to do. We could replicate this experiment really easily. What they did was they took their cell phone, they connected it via Wi-Fi, they used packet capturing to capture the packets, then they analyzed the packets, so what they did was they connected the cell phone to the Wi-Fi and they ran each program for five minutes to simulate normal use. And while simulate normal use, they then analyzed all the packets coming out of the phone to try to figure out what exactly each app was doing and who it was connecting to. And they took the database and the data set and they turned it into this really cool database on the Wall Street Journal. Let me show you how it works. We pick an app. We can pick any app. Uh, let's use Pandora because I know it's here and we already discussed it. Click on Pandora. Uh, we could look at the iPhone version of it. Um, sometimes you can click on the Android version of it too. But it gives you this really cool graph. And this is an interactive graph where the top is information it's taking from your phone and the bottom is information that they're passing through to third party content providers or advertisers or marketing companies. So we can see Pandora, the red is your phone ID, the UUID, the unique individual number of your phone. You do not want people having that number. Once we get your unique ID, it's very easy to compromise your phone. So, and by the way, Apple is putting a new procedure into place now that prevents apps from transmitting the UUID. They don't want people, they, they understand the problem. So it gives you the unique ID of your phone. 
your location, so it's seeing where you are, your age and your gender, your contacts, your usernames and passwords. It's accessing those, but it's not passing them through. The reason why these lines aren't connected is because the, 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 the um, Pandora is accessing it. It's just not doing anything with that information. So your phone ID, your location, and your age and gender for Pandora. And it's passing them through to these providers. It's giving Yahoo your location. So if you launch Pandora right now, Yahoo knows who you are and where you, where you are. So it's telling Yahoo, somebody from John Jay, just launch Pandora. It's telling Weekly Plus your location. It's telling Google Analytics your location. It's telling Google AdSense your age, gender, and location. It's giving Facebook your location. I don't know, I can't read that backwards. Oh, media lits, okay. It's giving them your phone ID. Google and DoubleClick. It's, 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 it's an ad campaigning marketing research company. Your age, gender, location, and phone ID. And it's giving Apple and Quattro your phone ID and location. So just by launching Pandora, you are communicating unbeknownst to you without your necessarily your permission with Yahoo, Google, Weekly Plus, Media Lists, Google, AdSense, Apple. Do you recognize that? Is that something that sticks in your mind? Do you say, let me listen to some music and tell Yahoo where I am? Is it a big deal that you're telling Yahoo where you are? I don't know. I use Pandora still. I don't seem to have a problem with it. Law enforcement officials investigators, attorneys with subpoena power. When are they going to start going to Yahoo for this information? Yes, they can go to Sprint and Verizon. And, and who knows, maybe Verizon's only keeping the data, your geolocation data, for a year or two at this point. But maybe Pandora is keeping it forever. So if I want to find out if Sebastian, if I want to find out if Sebastian was at John Jay today, and if I want to find it out 10 years from now, if he happened to have launched Pandora and created a record with his unique ID and his location, I could subpoena Pandora. I could subpoena Yahoo or Google and get that information. And depending on whether it's a criminal or civil action and what jurisdiction it's in, Sebastian might never know that I'm looking into him. And I think that if there's one lesson I've learned through all of this, the real problem and I mean this, the real problem is that all of this, when investigators go to do investigations, only the guilty people, find, and I don't want to say it that way, only the bad, nah, I can't say it that way, <laughs> only the people who are going to be arrested and indicted find out they've been looked at. We've created a system where the good people could be spied on, and the law, even if they're totally good, the law never requires them to be notified that they're being looked at. So only the bad people find out they're being looked at. And to me, I think out of everything I've looked at, that's the most disturbing thing. Because if you are um, Mother Teresa, the most holy person on earth, the government has the right to look into you and investigate you and get all of your emails that are more than six months old and get all your information that's with third party people and they never have to tell you about it. It's only when you are found to have done something wrong and you're indicted that, I, what is it, the Sixth Amendment? Is it the Sixth Amendment's the right to confrontation comes into play? What was that? Fourth, no, fourth is, no, not fourth. Right to confront witnesses, Sixth Amendment? I think it's sixth. Um, it's only then the Sixth Amendment comes into play and they have to tell you that they're looking at you and what they have. It's only then discovery starts up. It's only then disclosures happen. So the good people are investigated and they never know. And that's something that I have a problem with. As much as I think it's important for law enforcement to have the tools that they need, 
I don't want them having all of my information if I did something not wrong and never tell me about it. I think that if I'm being looked at, I should at least be you know, told after the fact, at least. And that's just Pandora. There are lots of other apps on here, and they have a little quick guide. Who gives a username and password? See, this is dangerous. Passwords. How many of you use the same password for almost every? Don't raise your hand. <laughs> Keep your hands down for this one. How many people use the same password for almost everything? If Pandora is passing it through to third parties, or if some of those apps like Angry Birds, anybody play Angry Birds? If they're passing through your username and password to a database that I own, what happens when I use that database to start logging into all your accounts as you using your credentials? When Facebook first came out, I was an early adopter of Facebook. This was before I was a faculty member, before I was a professor. When Facebook first came out, I immediately jumped on the bandwagon and I hired somebody to write an app with me. We wrote an app, an early Facebook app. It was an app that allowed people to take my photography and post it on their wall. It was called a gift giving app. Does that make sense to everybody? But at the time, Facebook didn't have privacy standards. If they did, they were horrible. So by installing the app on your Facebook site, it gave me, the app owner, almost complete access to your Facebook profile. All of your contacts, all of their pictures, everything that's private. Now, this was when Facebook first came out. Since then, and uh, yes, I have discontinued the app, app no longer exists, it's been taken down. When I went and did the move into academia, I can't do stuff like that anymore. So the app was destroyed, and it really was. It's not even on a server anymore, everything's gone. Facebook has tightened their grip on app people like that want your information. So Facebook has been restricting the information that apps could gather on you and pass through. But there are still a lot of old apps out there that are still in use. And you need to realize that by using one of these old apps, many of them were created just to, just to violate your privacy, just to obtain marketing information, just to obtain intelligence. So by using these old apps still today, you are putting yourself in a situation that you don't actually recognize, realize. You should be going back to Facebook, checking your privacy app settings, getting rid of old applications that have been authorized. Something like Angry Birds, Not so bad. They're only talking to Google, chill and go, but they're still giving that phone ID and username and password and location. Virtually our entire lives are being poured into these mobile devices. Today, the point of this lecture is to start you thinking about these issues. Congress is thinking about these issues. The media is thinking about these issues. Privacy advocates are thinking of these issues. Law enforcement are thinking of these issues. But so do you. You guys are the future of law enforcement, of, of government. It's time we start really taking a close look at investigations, privacy, and policies, and law having to do with mobile devices. The law is so far behind when it comes to our computers and our technology, we shouldn't accept the same anymore when it comes to mobile technology. We have too much at risk, too much at stake. We invest too much of our knowledge into our mobile devices, too much of our personality, so we need to always have the balancing. Now, I'm going to leave you with some conjecture. I have no direct evidence for any of this, even though almost everyone who knows about it agrees that it's as clear as day. When we talk about criminal investigations, the Constitution protects us. 
the Fourth Amendment, the First Amendment, the Fifth Amendment, the Sixth Amendment, are all really important amendments protecting us digitally. And they definitely protect us when it comes to criminal investigations. But post 9-11, there has been a split in this country. A split between national security and criminal investigations. National security is being routed through the National Security Agency and the military, while criminal investigations go more through law enforcement. What we are seeing is that there doesn't seem to be any rules when it comes to national security. The White House and Congress seem to be taking the standpoint that the Constitution does not apply. Don't have to believe me, go look it up yourself. Both Bush and Obama. And that the National Security Agency could do whatever they want as long as it's just for national security. We're fairly sure, with like 99% accuracy, that the NSA is monitoring every cellular communication we make, every word you say over the phone, every email, every text message is being permanently recorded by the National Security Agency, is being analyzed by computers, and if the right algorithms are met, it's bumped up to a real life analyst who looks to see if it's a threat. Now, I can't tell you if what the NSA is doing is right or wrong. And I can't tell you that because I'm standing here in the largest city in the world. One of the, I guess this is the largest city in the world. It's the largest safe city in the world, I'll tell you that much. I'm sitting here in the middle of Manhattan at almost 8.30 at night. I'm completely safe. I'm going to walk home as soon as I leave here, and I'm going to walk home. I'm not going to worry about being mugged. I don't go to, I, I live in a high-rise apartment 25 floors above ground level. I don't worry about a plane flying into my building. I feel safe. And am I safe because of the National Security Agency and their intrusiveness? Am I safe because of the NYPD and the way they handle themselves? I don't know. But what I do know is me and my family feel safe. And that's really important for us as Americans. But on the other side, the balancing side, do I really want every word I say on a phone being permanently recorded forever? Being analyzed for national security risks? Even if I'm not a risk today, with my luck I'll piss somebody off in the future who will deem me a risk in the future. These are all things that we really need to start just thinking about. We really need to start analyzing. Doctoral students, these are perfect subjects for dissertations. Master's students, master's thesis on these topics, there is a plethora, plethora or plethora? Plethora of peer-reviewed journal articles coming out on these topics. One or two of them will be by me this year, hopefully. We need to start paying a really close look at this so that three, four, five, 10, 20 years down the line, we don't regret it today. Because we need to provide that balance between investigations and privacy. I don't have the answer to what that balance is. It's all within us. My balance is different than your balance. It's different than everyone else's balance. So we need to have a conversation as a society to see what we'll put up with and what we won't. Thank you for coming tonight. We still have plenty of food left over for those of you who want. Um, before we get up and, and start a commotion, let me just ask if there are any questions because uh, uh, this is just a small chunk of the stuff that I've been looking at. I'm really interested in wireless security, Wi-Fi security. I was gonna do some experiments in here but decided not to. We'll do them in the future. Question. Yeah. My question is that uh, has there been an equal effort in the private sector to produce software that protects information on your phone? Sure. Uh, yes and no. Yes, in that there is a very large private sector move to be able to securely communicate via portable devices. Um, mobile Iron, for example, 
BlackBerry, they, they all put a lot of effort into securing your communications. There are new programs out there. One of them is called, I don't need to look it up, I know them now. One of them is called Tiger Text. Tiger Text, you need to write it down. Another one is called Wicker, W-I-C-K-E-R. W-I-C-K-R. Uh, uh, Wicker claims to provide uh, military-grade point-to-point encryption for text messages and private communications. They allow like self-destructing messages that erase themselves off your phone. They have a lot of options. So, so people are taking this seriously. There are, there's a lot of effort to let you live more privacy, pr m let you live privately. The problem with that is twofold. We don't want to exclude law enforcement that has a legitimate right. You know something? We could, be, we, could be the most in, we could be the most dedicated privacy advocates in the world. We still need law enforcement to have the right to get information when they have the legal right. The other issue, too, is while all of these products exist, you have a constant fight back on the other side of it to invade the, the sanctity of the security. For example, I'll give you a great example. Uh, everybody, anybody know the, the app WhatsApp? There's an app called WhatsApp. It's like a text messaging program. Anybody hear of it? Uh, Celebrite is very, very happy that they now support that program in their, in their software. So when you use a Celebrite unit, if you've been using WhatsApp app, the WhatsApp app, it will download that data set and it will, it will give it to you even though it's been erased. Um, one of the programs I showed you uh, today, one of like the $49 programs, also accesses WhatsApp. So even though there's a move to secure, there is an equal, if not greater, pushback from people who want to invade. That answer your question? Yeah. Yeah. Question. Uh, I know it's kind of a silly question, but as far as like, you know, the Capital One Bank, Discover, all that on the app phone, I assume that it's being shared the same as the Brazil, maybe? Or? Banking, mobile banking is a very difficult issue. I do not have enough information to, right now, give you a good answer. But I could give you a, I could tell you about a situation. When the first iPhone came out and the first app store was launched, Citibank was very quick to launch the first mobile banking application. Maybe they were the first or the second, but they were quick. I was a Citibank user at the time. I used the Citibank mobile banking app for a year until the new iPhone came out. Then I took my old iPhone and I sold it to somebody in Indonesia. So I took my old iPhone, I pressed reset, I did all, everything I could do to wipe it, and then I sent it to Indonesia. A year later, I get a letter from Citibank apologizing for a security risk with their old software. Turns out everything I did with their software, or almost everything, was being recorded to the local phone, and it wasn't being erased as part of the normal erasing processes. So the phone that I shipped to Indonesia had all of my banking information on it. They didn't update to their software, so their solution was just install our new software. But my phone was in Indonesia. So that could give you a really good idea. Um, I'll tell you that I've seen a number of studies recently that are starting to, um, they're starting to suggest that mobile, that online banking is more secure than traditional banking. There are less people interactions and causes for fraud in online banking. And there's a lot of fraud in traditional people banking. Um, so there's a lot of people, not me, other people looking at whether mobile banking and online banking is actually more secure because you take the, the teller and people out of the equation. It, it's nothing that we get an answer to today, though. Question? In the back, red shirt? They gave you the actual content of the messages, correct? Right. That, was the that were six months old. That was the beginning. They gave yeah. you the content of the message. They gave me the geolocation of the other person. They had a different carrier. They had Verizon. They, sh um, I guess my attorney ordered the subpoena really well. Mm -hmm.
Yeah. I enjoy working with law firms to word those subpoenas, by the way. Um, it's incredible the stuff that we can get. So what else did you get? You got towers, you got locations, you got the actual text messages. The geo, by the way, the E911 Act, has anybody ever heard of the E911 Act? The E911 Act required the cell phone companies to obtain and store geolocation information on every phone that's out there. So for geolocation, you don't need a smartphone. Um, I forgot, so there are two types of phones in this country. We have GSM and CDMA for the most part. I don't remember which one's which. One of the systems, all of the information comes from the phone. Um, so all of the information, even a dumb phone, all the geolocation information goes through the phone. The other system, it's through the towers. So the tower records and they triangulate. So yeah, you don't need a smartphone to know where you are. Um, uh, all that geolocation information is available on those cheap disposable phones. And actually there was just a case that came out a couple of days ago where the courts held that the government could track prepaid phones. So and that, that's a, a very new case. So, uh, are you one of my students? What class? Okay, we should talk one day because I'm really interested about your experience. Um, For people that know what they're doing, your password's an irrelevancy. Um, we don't even need a Cellbrite unit, Cellbrite unit to, to invade your iPhone. The, the master password for the, I'm not gonna mention, the master password you could just Google and look up. It's not a password that you could put into the phone. You have to actually go in and plug it in and, and, and enter it via terminal commands. Uh, but for anyone who knows what they're doing, your passwords on your phones or your computers are pretty much irrelevant. Whether you have a password on your Mac or your PC or your phone, passwords are never a good solution. Now, you should always use passwords. I'm not saying don't use passwords. You should always have passwords on your phone, but they're not going to keep people out who know how to get in. And it's very simple to get in. That answer your question? We'll take two more. Yeah, go back. Oh, uh, you, did, were you raising your hand? I already got one from you, so let me go one more. I'll come back if there's still time. Mm -hmm. Well, you got to remember the conversations exist on both sides of the channel. So AT and T and Verizon or Sprint, they're both recording everything. So if you're in a multi-carrier communication, um, whoever keeps the data the longest will have it. They might both have it, and, and different carriers are recording different parts of information. Um, so it, there, there are no clear answers yet. The only clear answer is we need clear answers. <laughs> Any other question? Yep, right up here in the front. Uh, when you type like your cell phone, when it's typed and uh, the more light, does it still destroy your admin information and will it be full of it? Um, almost all electron, almost, all electronic devices that we carry on us will make close to permanent records of information that travels through it. Especially an iPhone where it's go, it being stored on their flash memory. Now sometimes that information is overwritten. So if you fill it up, sometimes it overwrites and it erases the old stuff. Um, but in general, you have months if not years of data on your phone. It's not going to be deleted just by you hitting delete. It's really, re you need to be really careful today when you get rid of your mobile devices, when you sell your cell phones. Um, I have not spent time yet, and maybe I should, I have not spent time yet doing a good mobile forensic, doing a good digital forensic analysis of a totally white phone. Uh, I don't know if anybody in the audience has had an experience with it. We, I've looked at plenty of phones, but nothing that's been white purposely, and perhaps we should do that to see what's recovered. Um, that's a very good question. I know that it's very easy to get almost everything back, so who knows what you get back during a total wipe. Abe, you know? I just want to follow up both situations. Yeah. Cell phones, even same, same make, you know, 
Mm -hmm. an iPhone where it can actually retrieve everything, and then using a, another iPhone, same model and everything, and not getting anything. You know, so it's hit or miss, and it can be hit or miss. You know? One of the things, remember I told you about that Wicker program, W-I-C-K-R? One of the things they claim, I've never, again, tested it to see if it works. They actually have a file shredder in the program. And if you run the program, it claims it wipes your phone completely of all deleted information. And when I get access again to either a Celebrite unit or I have time to do an archive and then do an analysis through Backtrack, I'm curious what it's actually deleting and what it's not deleting. One of these days, uh, hopefully I can get together with some forensics people, we can get a subreddit unit, and we can really see what's being erased and what's being obtained. Uh, but I think Abe, uh, Abraham's point is really valid, that you know, different devices, people are doing different things with them, people are clearing them, people, you know, so not everything is equal, and who knows what we get back in the long run. That's a really important distinction. Uh, in the back? Yeah. Some of these phones allow you to do encryption Yes. Would that help you? So some of these phones allow you to do encryption. Would that help you? Um, yes, encryption is always, always a good thing. Um, there's uh, in, encryption, changing the data to a different format, uh, an encrypted format is always positive. Um, I, I've never, I mean, I'm sure it exists, but I've never heard of anybody being hurt by encrypting. But encryption is not the answer, the end answer. Encryption can be broken. The research for the Wall Street Journal article most of the information that was coming out of the cell phones was encrypted. And they used an open source tool to break the encryption. So, yeah, we need to encrypt. And my tools, my web tools, much, much of the websites that I use, uh, my students that use Project Gnosis, for example, they're all, they all use digital certificates. You know, we have um, certificates to encrypt the information and provide secure connections. But I think we'll be fooling ourselves if we think encryption is the overall protection that will always keep us safe. We're seeing more and more that good encryption is being defeated. Bank grade encryption, RSA encryption, uh, AES encryption. I mean, the reason why we have so much encryption today is because old encryption keeps becoming obsolete. So even stuff that's well encrypted today, five or ten years from now, will be as easy to de-encrypt as like child's play. Some of the old DES encryption that was around in the 80s, could be, and it used to take decades to break, could be broken now in seconds. Computers go faster, we learn more. So encryption is, is, is an answer, but it's not an end solution. Uh, the real end solution comes down to user practices, our behavior, and law. They actually sent me a sleeve to protect me too. One last question, then we're done for the night. Yes, right here. I'm going to answer it with a joke. I have heard rumors that when the British government wants to destroy electronic media, first they demagnetize it, so they put it through massive magnif you know, um, magnetic fields, then they shred it, so they actually take the entire disk or device and they put it through a shredder and they turn it into little pieces and then they lock it away in the safe forever. <laughs> now, I've heard that several times from people. So, so think about what the British government is doing to, to, to secure classified information. Thank you for coming. Um, please enjoy some of this food that was paid for by the Differential Tuition Fund of the MPA program. And have a good night.